Wonderful. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Chris Jacobs. I'm the executive director of Pinewoods Camp. I know many of, many of you are very familiar with Pinewoods um, or you are a uh, pond neighbor, so welcome. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we're very excited uh, about this year's Zoom series, which is focused on the Six Ponds region, uh, past, present, and future. And kicking us off tonight is Jackie Salthalamakia of the Herring Pond Wampanoag Tribe. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Jackie. Uh, Jackie proudly stands as a spirited firekeeper and embraces their identity as a two-spirit member of the Herring Pond Wampanoag Tribe. They draw insp inspiration and purpose from deep connection to their lineage as a direct descendant of Sakem Kachatasset in the royal line of Monument Ponds, Herring Pond, Wampanoags. Fueled by this ancestral connection, Jackie is motivated to channel their efforts with unwavering dedication towards the betterment of the Heron Pond Wampanoag tribe. And Sonia Kaufman, one of our awesome board members, is here and helping run tech. And Sonia will be uh, adding some chat links into the chat feature and uh, is posting Jackie's full bio if you want to read that. Uh, so thank you again. We are gonna hold questions until the end uh, and then we'll open up questions for Q&A. Um, so for here, I'm going to turn it over to Jackie. Thank you so much uh, for being with us tonight uh, and thank you, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Wanika and Wanonk, Natatuis, Jackie. Nutamas, Sikwana Makopakwit. Good evening. I am called Jackie and I'm from Herring Pond. Welcome everyone to our presentation of the past, the present, and the future of the Herring Pond Wampanoags. Tonight we will explore the history of the vibrant culture and the promising future of the Herring Pond Wampanoag people in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Throughout our discussion, we'll take a look into the resiliency and the aspiration of this small Wampanoag community, fighting against being erased and looking to beat the odds stacked up against their future. Our one hour presentation will cover a brief history of the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe, challenges of colonization, a glance at present day tribal life, environmental and conservation efforts. And then we'll follow with a 10 minute or whatever remaining minutes for questions and answers. Over the centuries, the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe has been called by many names, Patuxet, Pondville, Manamet, Komokomanskit, the Praying Indians. However, today we are known as the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe of Plymouth and Bourne, Massachusetts. The Herring Pond community holds a historical ancestral lands situated at the epicenter of the colonization of North America. These Wampanoag lands, specifically in Plymouth, Massachusetts, are ground zero of the extensive brutality and history of colonization and the appropriation of indigenous lands within the United States. The Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe's homelands span from Plymouth to the upper reaches of Cape Cod, Bourne, and Sandwich. The Herring Pond Wampanoag people are deeply rooted within this region, fishing the waters, cultivating the lands, raising our children here. For over a millennia, the Wampanoags maintained a continuous presence in this territory. Among all the historical tribes that endure in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts today, the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe stands alone as the sole tribe with lands in the town of Plymouth, Bourne, and Sandwich. More importantly, the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe has never relinquished ancestral rights to these homelands through treaty or sale. Here we're gonna discuss post-contact history of the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe and the establishment of plantation lands. 
From 1614 to 1617, the Wampanoag people lose 80% of their population to a disease that was called the Great Dying. By 1620, when the Pilgrims established a settlement on Wampanoag lands known today as Plymouth, the Wampanoags had already been decimated in their population. In 1638, an indigenous gravesite in current day Bourne becomes the first meeting house, a church for Herring Pond Wampanoag members established by Richard Bourne and Thomas Tupper for preaching to the natives. By 1655, the Plymouth colonial officials set aside a land, a plantation. Later in the establishment of the US territories, these plantations would become to be known as reservations, a word synonymous with the United States and native people. The plantation of the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe was further described in 1674 as being a tract of land preserved for them and theirs forever, which is near 10 miles in length and five miles in breadth, which is approximately 15 square miles or over 10,000 acres. In 1675, King Philip's war rages and over 40% of the remaining Wampanoag population is killed or sold off as slaves. In 1685, the Herring Pond Wampanoag is recorded as having 120 individuals. And by the end of the 1600s in 1694, the Massachusetts Bay government places all native people on the reservation lands under authority of the colonial officials who are so-called guardians of their plantation. By the 1700s, the Wampanoag population in the Plymouth colony has on, undergone a sudden and large scale loss of people and lands. In 1725, the Plymouth Colonial Institute institutes a proprietary system of land control for Herring Pond, with tribal members would be known as the collective owners of the land and, pro and or proprietors. In 1775, Herring Pond members fight on behalf of the independence in the American Revolution. By 1779, Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe members are recorded at 108 individuals. In 1790, the Trade and Intercourse Act is enacted. The Commonwealth leaves roughly 3,000 acres of the Herring Pond Wampanoag land, once three times this size, in tribal ownership. Originally spanning over 3,000 acres, these parcels included the Great Lot, which is 2,600 acres, the Meeting House Lot, 200 acres, and the Hever Herring River Lot, fondly known today as the Valley, with about 400 acres. In the 1800s, the Herring Pond Indian Cemetery was established, which today is known as Dinah Field, or in historical records, Lakewood Cemetery. In 1838, shortly after the cemetery, the Herring Pond Mission is built, and that meeting house stands today on Herring Pond Road in Plymouth, Massachusetts. In 1850, the Massachusetts legislatures approved the division of Herring Pond Wampanoag tribal lands. The land is split among tribal members, making 111 individual property allotments, inalienable to anyone other than the Herring Pond Wampanoags. The federal government did not approve this attempted extinguishment of tribal title as required by the Federal Intercourse Act. In 1850, the federal census identifies the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe. In 1861, the population of the Herring Pond Wampanoag people living on the reservation 
is 67. In 1890, the U.S. Commissioner of Indian Affairs identifies the Herringpon Wampanoag tribe as one of the few tribes in the Eastern United States still in possession of their lands. The Wampanoag Nation once included all of southeastern Massachusetts, eastern Rhode Island, and encompassed over 69 distinct tribal communities. The, Wa the Wampanoag people have undergone a very difficult history after assisting the pilgrims in the early 1600s. With the European settlers came much adversity for our tribe. Disease virtually wiped out whole villages, systems of government that bore little resemblance to our tribal practices and values. Missionaries intent on using and converting our Christ us to Christianity and private models of land use and ownership that conflicted with our tribe's own communal practices and values. The vast majority of these tribal communities were killed in battle, initiated by colonists to secure land. Our name, Wampanoag, means people, the first light. And in the 1600s, we had as many as 40,000 people in 69 villages that made up the Wampanoag Nation. These villages covered the territory along the East Coast as far as Weymouth and all of what is now Cape Cod and the islands, Southeast as far as Bristol and Warren, Rhode Island. We have been living on this part of Turtle Island for over 10,000 years. Today, the Herring Pond is one of three historical Wampanoag tribes surviving out of the original 69. With over 40,000 people, the Wampanoag people stand resilient today with 5,000 people. The Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe stands 200 strong with less than a half acre of land. But we stand with determination of our ancestors that we are still here. The future is that we're sitting on less than a half acre of on Her Herring Pond ancestral lands. And this is our Pondville meeting house. It was built in 1838. It remains standing today and continues to be in ownership of the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe. Our meeting house has become the heart of our tribe and a place where Wampanoag culture is taught, celebrated, and honored. It's here on less than a half acre of land. You can hear the echoing heartbeat of a resilient colonized people known as the Herring Pond Wampanoags. And um, I'm just gonna pause here for a minute because uh, I don't think that I um, completely understood when I was making these slides, how um, they would affect me. And uh, when you really uh, try to quantify what has happened to a, a community, um, to family, um, to land, to um, our wildlife, to our waters, um, it really does hit you. And um, I think that uh, that's when this uh, really hit me that <laughs> we have a half acre of land. Uh, <laughs> we have 200 um, tribal members and we're still here and we're resilient. So, uh, In 2019, the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe led an effort and petitioned the town of Plymouth to return the ownership of a six acre parcel 
that included the burial grounds known today as Herring Pond Indian Cemetery or Diana Field. Diana Path has been a major historical significance to our tribe. It sits on the land that we call the Great Lot, which is the parcel, which was approximately 2,600 acres. It originally belonged to the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe before it was drawn up on maps, taxed, or boarded by settlers. This land embodies the culture and historical implications for the tribe. This is the site of our burial ground and it officially dates back to the 1800s. Currently only a handful of graves are identified, but historical records point to as many as 50 tribal members at rest on this site. And further, written historical records do not recognize the estimation that this was an active site well before cultural of burial was practiced. Self-determination, preservation of land and culture and traditions. Again, I think uh, this slide was a slide that uh, when I was making it, it really, um, it really sank in and it really uh, makes me wanna go out there and do more work. <laughs> um, so today there's 5,000 Wampanoags that live in New England. There are multiple Wamp Wampanoag communities, Aquina, Mashpee, Herring Pond, Osonet, Chappaquiddick, Pocasset, and Senoconk. There's an importance of the power of place. It's never more evident than it is with Native people. The ability to have self-determination, preservation of lands and cultural traditions is now the challenge taken on by the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe. With 99% loss of lands and 95% loss of Wampanoag community and population, this small resilient tribe speaks, we are still here. Today, the tribe is taking on efforts to raise money to acquire 38 acres of our ancestral homelands. This land is called Triangle Pond in Plymouth, Massachusetts. This is a big undertaking for our tribe. We are a small tribe and this fundraising goal is really big for us. But what's more important is even if we acquire these 38 acres, with the six acres that the town of Plymouth gave back to us, with the half acre that the tribe was able to keep in their possession, that would give us a total of 45 acres of our ancestral homelands. That's less than a half a percent of our original plantation. So our tribe is still here. We've always been here. We've been in Plymouth, born, sandwich, and it's important to understand that we may not have always been on the front page, but we are here. We are here learning our language. We are a part of a joint collaboration and efforts with Mashpee and Aquina and a sonnet with the Language Reclamation Project, where our language for more than 150 years laid dormant and Jesse Little Doe bringing back to life the language. 
We've had publications of our coloring books of young native artists. We've had libraries where we have food sovereignty programs and literature and free Wi-Fi. We celebrate Herring Day. The herring are a sacred fish. It signals the return to life after winter. This is Native American Wampanoag New Year. The return of life returning, our relatives giving birth to new life from the old, a rebirth. The young ones start to emerge, the cubs start to awaken, the sun starts to feel warmer and the world starts to be busy with more movement after its time and rest. In 2023, an all woman led machoon, and a machoon is a traditional Wampanoag boat was headed up by one of the Herring Pond Wampanoag youths. A 120 foot white pine ancestor became a life-giving machine to carry a group of six Herring Pond women onto the great Herring Pond. This has not been done in over 300 years on these waters. Wampanoag tribal communities gathered alongside non-natives to celebrate this week long event held at Herring Pond. In 2008, the residents at an annual town meeting approved a $1 million for Preservation Act funding. A portion of that funding was earmarked for construction of a boat ramp, a deck, in a small parking lot overlooking the Great Herring Pond. The site is Herring Pond's Wampanoag tribe's burial ground, and also a historic pre-woodland era summer encampment. The Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe advocated for a LIDAR study from the town, and it was granted before any work took place. The survey team was led by John Steinberg, a research scientist with the Fisk Center Ar Archaeology Research at UMass Bar Boston. The study came back conclusive of a major cultural significant area. To date, there has no, been no work. In 2024, the tribe and its citizens are defending our sacred lands and protecting the rights of nature. We as natives believe we have an obligation to our homelands to steward this land and assist others and other relatives who do not have a voice in today's world. The land is sacred and one of the most important portions of the land is where Turtle Island greets the waters. This is very sacred space. This is a space where all things connect. We are the first people of light and have ceremony at these waters by offering prayer and relations and connections to these items. Currently, we have, I would like to say only one, but we definitely have more than one uh, conservation efforts that are undergoing with the tribe. Uh, that goes from our herring and our lands where, or Bering Hill, where our ancestors are, all being um, put up for construction and uh, deforestation. We're fighting against sand mining, industrial ground mounted solar farms. And this is increasing at an alarming rate in our local area.
we work with Community Land and Water Coalition to stop this. The Herring Pond Wampanoag Chair has spoken out against solar farms that are causing fast deforestation. Over 250 acres have been lost. Chris, I'm going to have you jump in right here. And um, if you would please read your uh, land acknowledgement from Pine Woods. Thank you, Jackie. As we participate in this Zoom session, we would like to recognize the land that we call Pine Woods today. Before we begin this acknowledgement, sit quietly for a moment to reflect on the towering pine trees, the wind rustling through the leaves, and the ripples on the ponds. We honor and thank the Wampanoag Nation, whose traditional and unceded lands we gather on at camp. We are grateful for their stewardship of this land across hundreds of generations. We extend our gratitude to the waters of Long Pond, Round Pond, and the land and trees that sit between them. We are fortunate to share in their gifts, and we take responsibility for sharing the tradition of stewardship for generations to come. We honor and thank our neighbors, the sovereign Wampanoag communities of Herring Pond, Mashpee, and Aquina. We celebrate their deep and ongoing relationship with this land and recognize their resilience in the face of violence and persistent discrimination. We affirm our commitment to build authentic relationships with our indigenous partners and neighbors and engage in respectful allyship through our actions. Our progress towards these goals is ongoing and we're very excited about our current projects, growing partnerships and the work that lies ahead. We invite you to learn more about our action steps and guiding principles uh, that are being posted in the chat. Thank you, Jackie. And I think this is really where we're gonna open it up for discussions, but I, I wanna say thank you to Pine Woods and thank you to Chris Jacobs. Um, the importance of land acknowledgement statements it's it's huge it creates conversations it creates uh friendships it creates relationships and um without it i don't think we would be as strong as we are today and um land acknowledgement is more than a formality it's a crucial step towards recognizing and dismantling the ongoing effects of colonization by acknowledging the land and its original stewards. We pay respect to the indigenous nations, their elders and their descendants. This practice also serves as a reminder of our responsibility to address the historical injustice and support the sovereignty and the rights of indigenous people. So this is really where I would like to have um, open up for conversation and um, talk about. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, so you can put questions in the chat function and we'll monitor that, or you can use the uh, reactions button and raise your hand uh, and that will help us um, find you in the list. So thank you so much, Jackie. Uh, Jackie has a ton of knowledge, uh, and so please ask your questions. I, I have a question. Uh, what is LIDAR? LIDAR. 
Uh, LIDAR is a ground penetrating X-ray. Um, so that was used to scan back and forth over the land. And at that time, they discovered um, what they considered to be significant uh, burial sites within the area that the town was wanting to put the boat ramp. Uh, it looks like Wendy, you have a question. I'm going to ask you to unmute and you can ask your question. Yes. Um, I was glad to hear about the grant that you got for the deck, et cetera. Um, but I think you said no work has been done yet. Uh, can you say if you have funding, why that isn't moving forward? Um, there was no grant for the deck. Um, that grant was, if, if you're talking about um, where the LIDAR survey was done for the, um, yeah, if we go back, I'll, uh, so right here. The town was actually granted this money to buy this uh, land. And this land was indigenous herring pond land, um, in particular, <laughs> the Hirsch property, which is my family uh, ancestries. And it's right next to our herring pond Wampanoag tribal burial grounds. And they were going to, right beside the burial grounds, improve their entryway into the great herring pond um, with a new boat ramp and dock and a parking lot. And um, the town voted it and it got approved. However, the tribe uh, petitioned the town to do a LIDAR ground penetrating X-ray um, of the area, because we believe that this was a, you know, an extensive uh, burial ground that may not have um, stones. And the findings were significant area of cultural uh, significance. Um, the town has not done any work in this area. And is there a reason they have not, or did the tribe ask them not to do any construction? Um, under state laws, there's a reason that they would have to push forward. And um, because of cultural significant uh, findings, they would have to have specific laws that would allow them to go forward. So essentially, uh, as I understand- It's an active it, burial site. Yeah, it's an active burial it's a, site. It's and, a burial yeah. site and they would have to, they would have, to uh, have significant, um, they wouldn't be able to bear, they wouldn't be able to build there. Excellent, thank you. All right, so we do have some questions coming in, um, actually lots of questions coming in through the chat. Um, so the first one is, how are the remaining lands owned by the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe managed? Well, that's easy. We only have a half acre. <laughs> well, actually, I'm sorry, six and a half acres. Um, and that is managed by the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe. And Jackie, the six acres at Dinah's Path, mm -hmm. uh, there are lots of restrictions on that, correct? Is correct. It um, so, correct. Um, none of these, the, the six acres that we received back, um, there's conservation restrictions on this land. Um, it's also a burial ground, um, so there's no, uh, we can practice um, our ceremonies up there, we can um, honor our ancestors, we can forage there, um, but there is no building, there is no ability to do anything except keep it in preservation. Mm. Thank you. Okay. So we having multiple of the same questions, what which essentially are 
what what can we do? You know, obviously they can donate to the Triangle um, Pond Fund. Um, but what else? Other than that, what else can uh, they do? What What are the next steps for someone that wants to support the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, one of the things I would say is just get out there and, and talk, right? Um, if you could share this uh, page, the fundraising campaign, if you can share it on your social media, if you can talk about it, if you can get it out there, um, that helps us. It helps us raise the money so that we can acquire these lands. Um, and as far as what else you can do, I would say start to have conversations with Native people. <laughs> That's where it starts. It starts with a simple coffee or, you know, um, maybe a walk in the woods and we're uh, foraging and picking cranberries. Um, it starts simple and it just so that you can understand that we're still here. We're not a relic. We're not a thing of the past. And that um, we have struggles and our struggles are a lot. And um, if you just took the time to sit down and or walk or um, have conversation with us, you would understand the struggle that we have ahead of us. And um, to follow up someone, you know, saying very generous of you to give your time and energy to educate non-Native people and field questions, but are there things that you wish that uh, non-Natives were more curious about? Yeah, I do. Um, I wish non-Natives were more curious about how the system was put together to identify who is considered Native in this country. Um, we are one of the three historical tribes in Massachusetts. Uh, Aquino and Mashpee are federally recognized. We are not. In the state of Massachusetts, just its own um, laws does not recognize state tribes. Um, so understanding how this system is put in place to rip apart the fabrics of a native community. And I think it's evident when you see there was 69 tribes and today there's less than five, um, that it was a very efficient system. And um, having the federal government decide who is native and who isn't um, with how the colonization and how the birth of this country took place I think when you think about here, um, again, I use the word ground zero because it happens so quickly within the first 100, 200 years, um, the loss of land and um, native population, that by the time this um, federal structure of how to handle Native Americans got to the West, it uh, it looked very different than how it is today and, and how it was in 1620, 1675, 1780, um, 1838. So um, I think being curious about how that system is in place and um, I would say that it's a very harmful situation it's a harmful system. Thank you. Um, another question that has come in um, is wondering if the tribe has easy access to Herring Pond itself. The pond? The Great Herring Pond. No, <laughs> we do not have access uh, to Great Herring Pond. Our uh, Our meeting house um, is on Herring Pond Road, uh, 128 Herring Pond Road in Plymouth, Mass. However, it does not have access to Herring Pond. Um, our 
tribal cemetery um, overlooks Great Herring Pond. Um, but again, there's no access uh, to the pond from there for, for the tribe. So when you were doing the machine burning, you had to go on someone else's property, I'm assuming? Correct. Um, it was an individual uh, tribal member's property uh, that they owned, and they gave the Herring Pond tribe um, permission to be there. We were there for a whole week when we burned that machine. Um, so I know that the um, machine burning, you did allow the public to come and look at that. Um, can you tell, tell us a little bit about the process of how you burn the machine? Absolutely, sure. Um, it started with us going um, out into Western Mass to a sanctuary that I identified a um, 120 foot white pine as being needed to be taken down. And um, this sanctuary was very happy that uh, we were going to turn the ancestor into a machine. And so we went out there and we blessed the tree and we thanked the tree for giving its life and for it to become a machine. And a machine is a traditional boat that carries uh, a person in the water. And uh, so we were able to get the tree, have brought it to all the way to Plymouth. And um, from there, we debarked it. And then um, slowly from afterwards of the debarking, we had a ceremony. Um, and then we started to uh, burn slowly um, hot coals and um, it's a lot of burning, a lot of scraping, a lot of community, um, 24 hours a day. There's a dedicated uh, team that all they're doing is scraping, burning, scraping, burning. They're using wooden tools. They're using clams, clamshells. Um, the community is surrounding them and singing and drumming. And uh, there's always lots of food. There's always lots of food and um, everybody just camps out and um, it becomes a, um, it, it's good medicine. It's good medicine for the community. And not only was it good medicine for our community, it was good medicine for the uh, broader community on Herring Pond. Um, when we launched that machine into the water, there was cheers that came out all over the pond and um, not just from where we were. Um, it was just echoing on the waters. And uh, it was a, a pretty big uh, moment that was shared with a lot of uh, people that day. That's wonderful. Um, we have a question here. Um, why, uh, can you explain why you call the tree an ancestor? Hmm. Absolutely. Um, well, they are. They're, we, I would say that we believe that nature is sovereign. Our relationship to the land and to um, the waters is that it's a gift. That's not something to be commodified. Um, it's something to be respected and um, held and honored. Hmm. Um, and what is the minimum width for a machine? It looks like a pretty big, <laughs> yeah, like a pretty big tree. <laughs> I would love to say the minimum width, uh, yeah. So the circumference of that tree uh, was at 120 years old. Uh, I would say, that it was at least 24 inches wide at that base, or maybe even more, 36 inches at the widest part of that. Um, Cause we cut it really low at the bottom of the base so that we get the widest part of the trunk of the tree. Um, yeah. All right, there are more questions, lots of questions here. Um, mm -hmm. Someone's asking if the recording of this Zoom will be available and yes, it will be uploaded to Pinewood's 
uh, YouTube channel, and then uh, we'll take that link and then embed it into our um, page for the series. Um, you know, we're doing this winter series. The next one is coming up on April, I mean, sorry, March 26. Um, so yes, this will be available. Um, and Sonia just linked our YouTube channel uh, in the chat. Um, and so, okay, so lots of questions. Okay, going back up, um, folks are wondering, um, are there ever any public programming that you do that um, Herring Pond Wampanoag Tribe does? Um, public programming. Um, yeah. So learning, yeah, events and learning opportunities. Um, are there, do you have anything coming up? Um, I don't know if we have anything coming up, but there is a, the link to our page and that's where we post things. Um, the tribal council and the committees post things both on our Facebook page and our Twitter account. Excellent. And those are those links have been posted in the chat feature. And uh, anyone uh, that signed up, what we can do too is take all the links and we can send them to you um, so you have them. Um, all right. So um, the next question, someone wants to uh, hear more about the garden and food sovereignty program. Um, uh, and how does it help teach youth about traditional growing practices? Yeah, so um, the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe has a, a garden and it was started uh, last year underneath the Massachusetts um, wellness program. And that's came to the idea that our food is a part of our wellness, our, um, the way that we grow our plants, the understanding about how these plants are grown, um, how they're grown together to support each other. Um, all summer long, we held a weekly um, class for our youth and for our elders. The garden had all levels of accessibility to garden. We talked about the importance of the three sisters. We talked about the importance of foraging. And all this leads into a larger conversation about food sovereignty and what that means for the Herring Pond Wampanoag people. Food sovereignty isn't just something that you go and get. It's not a ham that is given to you or a sack of potatoes. It's this understanding of how to grow your food where to forage, how to understand the seasons. But food sovereignty also might look like preserving 38 acres for wildlife to have biodiversity within those acreage and not be deforested. Food sovereignty could also look like a group of 10 individual tribal members writing to the DEP about the health of the herring run and how a structure wanting to be built next to it is going to cause harm to not only the herring, but to the significant cultural area that it is. So food sovereignty may look like understanding how to skin a deer, how to use the ligaments for sinew, how to hunt, how to fish. So the garden is just a starting place of understanding food sovereignty and how it's wellness for us and how it's good medicine. Well, now um, that garden, I know that you had a garden last year um, behind the meeting house um and uh and i encourage you um the community uh funny story jackie and i how we met 
I was at that meeting house. Uh, it was used um, for a low cost clinic pet vet. And I brought my kitten there and it's a first come first serve. And so I was sitting outside under a tree um, waiting my turn. And I saw this person going back and forth. They're working the land. They were taking, you know, weeding and cutting back things. And I went into my appointment. I came back and I got into the car and I'm like, oh, I wonder. I had been trying to meet someone from the Herring Pond community. And I got back out of my car and I went up to this individual and I, I said, hello. And I just started having a conversation. And that person just happened to be Jackie. And so that was less than a year ago. Um, <laughs> had lots of nature walks. We've gotten to know each other um, and learn about each other's communities. And so when, you know, when you ask what you can do, educate yourself, be curious, ask questions. Um, I think, you know, coming from a non-native, one of the things is that you're afraid that you're going to ask the wrong questions. Um, and, I, and I guess my response is don't be afraid. Um, because I think someone who is native, who is indigenous, would much rather you ask a question than not. Uh, and, and so I think that that's really important. Um, and and so that's just a quick little story about how we we um, got to know each other, and we've had this friendship that's blossomed since then. Um, so thank you, Jackie, for being there that day. So <laughs> um, and, I, and I see that Roberta has uh, her hand raised. So I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hello. Um. Thank you. Um, it's been quite a lot of information to take in, <laughs> but okay. And I won't go. I won't ask you how long it took you to put this documentation together. But what I'm really interested in is that what you state now in 2024, there are less than 20 individuals who are in the Wampanoag tribe. Uh, Is that no. true? So no, um, I and, and we had talked about this slide a little bit um, and I needed to point that out. So 111 um, allotment lands were given to individual Herring Pond tribal members. That was the original Herring Pond tribal land. Of okay. that 111 parcels, there are 20 individuals living on those parcels. Oh, I understand. Tribal members. And the so, tribe itself holds a half acre on the original lands. Well, now six and a half acres. So in total, how many Wampanoag are registered? Uh, so if you think about the Wampanoags, the Wampanoag is the state and then the tribes would be the towns. So the Wampanoag Nation currently today is a guesstimate about 5,000 members. And the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe is about roughly 200. Okay. So, um, I guess my question is, is what is your legal options with going forward? Um, there, are, there are three ways to get federally recognized. Um, there's congressional and there's also um, the federal process. So um, if we were taking example of the tribes within the state of Massachusetts, uh, Aquina went through congressional and they were granted um, federal status through the congressional method. And then Mashpee, if you've you know seen the history and all the newspaper articles, they actually went through the federal process. Um, the federal process today has uh, changed recently and there has not been a tribe that has been awarded federal status since it's been changed. Um, what year was that? 
that the federal status was changed. I want to say that was in 2021. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have any reason for that? What was going on, the federal judges, the appointments? Oh, yeah, I mean, political climate is a, a big deal when um, things are getting passed. And I, see. I, I believe that that was a major part of that. Okay, I understand. Um, but I'm assuming that you are not giving up on this getting recognition. No, ma'am, we are currently fighting um, today. And one of the things that we talk about, you know, when you talk about what can, can you do, um, when you when the state that you live in doesn't have a, a recognition process and they are denying the tribes that are here, um, towns having declarations um, where they identify the tribes, um, that's a big step, right? Not just identifying the lands, but identifying the tribes that held those lands and who they are in present day. And um, the more that that happens, you know, if the if the town of Plymouth, if the town of Bourne um, started to recognize the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe, um, then, you know, the state at that point would also have to start to answer some questions about recognition. And um, so, yeah, we we are working with a group of um, lawyers and we're trying to understand what the best option moving forward is for us. Um, but it's a complicated one and it has great consequences if, if failed. So it's not something you take on lightly. Well, if it fails, you'll be no worse than you are now. So, but, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Absolutely correct. And what I will say to you is I don't always believe that federal recognition should be the only path. Um, I believe that there has to be another way. And um, I still hold on to that belief. Well, okay. So is there a fund, somehow I missed this, that can work towards your legal representation goals? There is. Um, we work with multiple organizations. We also work with institutions um, and the institutions have pro bono lawyers that help us with our constitution, our bylaws. Mm -hmm. um, we have our own um, tribal member who's also a lawyer who's currently taking on uh, three different uh, land issues that we're trying to conserve and preserve. Um, and she does that pro bono. Um, however, it, it's not enough <laughs> considering what we're facing. So we do have a um, funding site. It's on our uh, website, Herring Pond, and you can always donate there and you can um, say that that particular um, funding, you would like it to go to, um, you know, the preservation of land or um, to lawyer fees. Thank you. Yes. Very informative. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roberta. Uh, Emily, uh, you have your hand raised and have a question. Emily? All right, we're going to come back. And Emily, if you have a question again, uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, Aaron, go ahead. Oops. Maybe I have to ask you to unmute. Oh, here I am. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I just had two comments for Jackie. <clears throat> um, I I understand the emotional labor that it takes to prepare a presentation like this, not only to just prepare it, but then to come and express it to non-Native people like myself. And I just want to acknowledge the work you've put into this, and I genuinely appreciate your time and effort and the emotional labor that has gone into providing this opportunity to us. And secondly, I also, I got emotional at the land acknowledgement. I was just at Wildlands Trust earlier today, just, you know, spring is on its way. It's still a little cold and just connecting with nature. And I, I truly feel we've, we have lost a, a 
a connection with nature. Um, and I just want to acknowledge and appreciate this opportunity and for everyone being here tonight. So thank you so much. No, oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I feel the same way. And I think that's why these conversations are so important today. Um, you know, the land is inseparable from us. Um, and once you really start to feel that and understand it and experience it, um, you understand what's going on with this climate and the crisis that we're heading into and how important it is for us. And I always say the land doesn't need us to save it. We need to save our connection with the land. And that's really what needs to be saved, right? How we connect to the land. And um, so thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Jackie. All right, now I'm going to ask you to unmute, unmute uh, Aaron. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Jackie. And what, what you just said, Jackie, is still like sinking in about the land. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of knocked me over. So now I have to, so I guess, so thank you so much. And to what, oh. to what Emily said about the amount of work that goes into doing a presentation like this. Um, Really appreciate it. Um, I guess my question, one thing I was really, really interested in that you spoke to was about uh, language reclamation as well. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'd be curious to hear what I, I assume, are you, you're involved in the in language reclamation projects yourself? Sounded like. I'm a student and I, 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 see, I say student. that um, I'm, I'm very, beginner student but uh, <laughs> as it's very complicated but uh, yes <laughs> yeah so my question then is I guess what is the language as like learning and immersing yourself in the language what does that stir in you like how is how you grown as a person um in that in that in that beautiful work you know I was at language class on Monday night and um Jessie Little Doe is leading the language class she's the one that brought our language back after 150 years it hadn't been spoken and um interesting enough about our language um the bible and all the missionaries that were created in churches um the king james bible was uh, put into wampanoag language so that it could assimilate our people and our communities and um funny enough uh ended up bringing back the language right so it, it's poignant right and um we have our language class in our meeting house and it's also a church um so on monday night i had uh i had joked and i said i'm gonna introduce myself and i'm gonna use my native tongue and uh I, I hope I don't screw it up. And I had been practicing and practicing and uh, Jesse just kind of joked with me. And she said, even if you do, nobody's gonna know <laughs> because there isn't a lot of our, our native speakers. Um, but it also, she said something to me that just hit me. It, she said, this is more important than gold. You passing on your language is the biggest gift that you can have. And um, it really sets in when you can speak it and you can introduce yourself and you can just say hi and who you are in your native tongue and um it humbles you in ways that i i wish i could explain wow thank you um and and you know lots of questions here and i don't know if we'll be able to get to all of them but you were just speaking of the tribal headquarters but it's also um, a church and someone's asking the new Baptist church is the same as the tribal headquarters. Why is that? Uh, so I, I guess that's a really complicated um, answer, but I'll try to do my best. Uh, today, currently um, the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe um, has to rent out uh, the building uh, to keep it um up to date, but even then, um, the small amount of money that we have um, from renting it out to um, the Baptist church um, isn't enough to keep it going. So we have to 
find grants and we have to find um, support so that we can, you know, um, put new windows in, make it um, AD accessible. Right now, uh, we have a, it's unable for um, our handicapped uh, vet veterans and our handicapped elders to get into the building. So um, that's what we do currently uh, to keep the building running. All right, and um, I think uh, if you have any questions, um, please raise your hand. We'll just do a couple more. Um, and then the last question it, I have here, or actually there's a bunch, but um, someone wants to know, what is the location of Triangle Pond? Mm. So the location of Triangle Pond is just north of um, the Great Herring Pond. So... Um, I would say, oh, I wish, did I put a picture? I don't think I did put a picture of it, but um, what I can do is on this link, we actually have a brochure um, for the fundraising campaign and it actually shows an overhead view of the area, but it's just north, um, maybe 10 miles north of Great Herring Pond. And uh, over by, is it, what pond is that? Oh my God, there's so many. I, I don't think it's even that far. Um, yeah, it might even be closer. It might even be like five miles. Yeah, it, it's not far from Herring Pond. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with um, um, Pinewoods Camp uh, and Long Pond, Great, pond, Great Herring Pond is, uh, what would you say, about five miles from here, Jackie? Yeah, I'd say about that. Yeah, about five miles. So it's not it's not that far um from where pinewoods campus um all right um and let me see if more questions came in um someone asked if you partake in the annual herring uh festival at jenny pond in april and how do you view that annual event i do not take part in the one at jenny um I do, however, uh, take part of one at um, in Bourne at the Herring Run. Um, it's an important time for us. It's an important time, again, because I talk about how the Herring are a significant part of spring and our Wampanoag New Year. But also how they're being affected today our elders tell of stories where you could just put your hands out and catch a herring. And now um, we're having devastating effects on marine life and um, overbuilding and pollution and just, you know, um, deforestation, um, putting in dams. All of these are having significant um, effects on the herring population. And um, Massachusetts uh, Division of Marine Fisheries does a great uh, job at trying to increase the herring population, um, but it's definitely something that is struggling. And um, you can really feel that when you're at the herring run and you don't see as many. So um, in a lot of ways, it's uh, something that makes you aware it, it makes you aware of what we're doing to the lands and the water and how it's affecting more than just the people that are a part of the land. Thank you so much, Jackie. And we're gonna wrap it up. It is, uh, um, it's 10 after, um, 10 after eight here. Uh, so um, what we'll do is, again, this program is going to be uh, uploaded to our YouTube channel. We ask that you share it. Um, and, uh, you know, just some things that PCI Pinewoods does, you, you know, like what can you do? And it's as simple as in the off seasoning, um, in the off seasoning, uh, off season opening um, camp um, to the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe. Uh, they, um, we, we have pine cones open, uh, and it's available for their use. Um, we are storing venison in one, of, in the camp freezer, um, for the Herring Pond tribe right now. 
um, that they get donated from the states. Um, we we gave you, um, we're, we're working your, what were you working on, a bow? Were you using a, a bow? We, oh, right. We cut down a Norway maple, a young Norway maple, which is an invasive species here at camp. Uh, you know, not here at camp, but across Massachusetts. Uh, and um, it's very straight and maple is good for creating bows. Uh, and so, um, and it's simple things like that. And it's just having conversations and learning and your willingness to learn. And so I encourage you, um, you know, many of you don't necessarily live right here, but I encourage you to reach out to your local community and find out who your indigenous um, tribes are in your own community, um, write to your legislature um, and give them voice uh, as well. And which is part of um, our program, um, our winter Zoom series is, is giving uh, our indigenous neighbors a, a voice. So thank you so much. Uh, next one coming up is um, about the history of, um, of Long Pond specifically. Uh, and so that is um, by Sam Chapin, who is uh, a local historian and friend of Pinewoods. Uh, so join us uh, for that. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Jackie for final words. So I just wanted to thank everyone and um, especially thank Pinewoods Camp. Uh, just starting a conversation, just saying hi, um, it, it means the world to me. And um, it has inspired me to continue to do good work on days when I don't think I can uh, keep going, uh, having friends <laughs> that uh, I can talk to and that I can just, you know, get lost in the woods with <laughs> foraging and um, identifying all these different plants. It's um, it's been inspiring and it keeps me going. And, uh, so thank you. Thank you. Else. Have a great night, everyone. Um, and we will see you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now.